So somebody who's been a veteran diplomat, who's actually been the foreign secretary of this country, believes that music can change the course of South Asia and can be a bond that connects countries of this volatile region. And she isn't some set-piece peacenik. Like I said, she retired as at the top of her game as the Foreign Secretary of India. Please put your hands together for Nirupama Rao. Let's have her on the stage. Thank you so much. I want to ask you before we call Ravi on stage, you're the founder of the South Asian Symphony Foundation or Chirag. And you're actually saying to this hard-nosed, volatile, unpredictable world that music can be the new magic. Can you explain the reason for your optimism given how much you would have seen in the insides of government on what goes up and down, especially be between problem nations like India, your problematic relationships like India-Pakistan? Yeah. Uh, well, I have no illusions, Barkha, about the state of affairs in South Asia. And I've seen bombs going off, I've seen terror attacks, I've been in very difficult negotiations. But I've also witnessed the pulse of the people, felt the pulse of the people. There is a genuine need and felt need at the human level to reach out across walls, across borders, across barriers, and just connect with each other. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do with the foundation, with Chirag, the Symphony Orchestra of South Asia, just lighting that little lamp in the hope that we can illuminate a little of the darkness. So it's a bit John Lennon-esque, right? You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Yes, I'm not the only <laughs> one, I'm sure. <laughs> but what, you know, I, having known you as a, I, you know, when you've been in government, music was always a parallel passion and you've kept up with it. What does music uh, do for you that joint statements don't? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know joint statements, I always think of the Agra summit and oh the joint God. statement yes. that never got done. Yes. I think an orchestra could be a model for what joint statements should be like. And uh, essentially what you try to do is to create out of counterpoint yeah. harmony. And you really believe this, you know, some of your colleagues might dismiss you as being too romantic. You know the times we live in. And, we, and, and frankly, it's a fair question. We live in an age of terrorism. We have a very serious terror threat from Pakistan. What can music do? As much as we may love to sing uh, or hear Iqbal Bano and Faiz Ahmed Faiz and Farida Khanum and, 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 and feel that bond, that doesn't change the institutional problems. I don't think uh, this orchestra or this foundation has been set up in order to dissolve the problems, for instance, between India and Pakistan. That was certainly not my intention. The intention is, as I said, just to be able to create a space, an opportunity, just the give them a chance, giving peace a chance, literally, getting people to connect, and I mean the young people of the region. It's true that we haven't been able to connect to Pakistan. Yeah. And uh, there is a lot of work to be done in that regard. But I've been able to make friends in Afghanistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan. And what is interesting about the initiative that we've launched is we've connected to the diaspora. The entire diaspora of South Asian origin that is scattered all around the world. It sounds fabulous and we're going to hear, we're going to see clips of this orchestra, we're going to hear Nirupama sing, there's a lot coming up, but I want to now welcome on stage somebody who's created a fantastic, fantastic, I think the best lit fest in the country. Which one am I talking about? Well done. So Ravi, Ravi, as I call him, wears many hats, he's the chairman of Feedback Consulting, but of course <laughs> uh, he's also the creator, curator, founder of the Bangalore Literature Festival. And please, may we welcome Ravi Chandra on stage. Put your hands together for Ravi. Come on, better than that. Thank you. And I'll leave it to Ravi and Nirupama now. Thank you, Barka. Uh, Ambassador Rao, I think Barka has created a Vaga border out here. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Rao is how everyone refers you as... But you know, you are the pinnacle of the foreign services as the, as, I mean, the foreign secretary. So shouldn't it be Secretary Rao? Well, in the US, they call me Madam Secretary, in fact. But here, I think uh, people are more used to the terminology okay. ambassador. But I'm, I'm just Nirupama Rao, frankly. <laughs> and you were ambassador both of, China, of India in China as well as the US, right? I was an ambassador to China. In fact, the first woman from India so far to be ambassador to China. 
and I was ambassador to the United States, and also the first woman from India to be High Commissioner to Sri Lanka. Uh, these are difficult relationships. I know. And uh, do you miss not being around in these Trumpian times? <laughs> Well, I tweet a lot like Donald Trump, I can tell you that. Do, do, do follow her. Yes, please do follow me at N Menon Rao. That's a blatant self-promotion. And uh, I, I, well, I realize Trumpian times are very different from the Obama era when I served in Washington. But I think the Trumpian era is more a reflection of a global trend towards hypernationalism, uh, towards, you know, the people who've been left out wanting their voices right. to be heard. And it's a time of great transition, a time of fundamental change in global affairs. And Mr. Trump is just one symptom, symptom of that. Of the whole thing. Mm. Now, you know, post-retirement, I, I know you have a certain love for music. You've trained to be a singer. Legend has it that your husband Sudhakar Rao sings too. You started your <laughs> career at Vienna. Now, Post-retirement, you could have taken a sinecure job, been part of a think tank and the like, but you take this onerous task of setting up this symphony, the South Asia Symphony. What prompted you to do this? Well, a woman's work is never done, as you know. <laughs> and uh, I uh, have been doing a lot of things after retirement. I've been teaching at a couple of US universities. I'm writing a book on India and China, which is due out uh, in the middle of next year. And I do a lot of public speaking and writing for the newspapers. But in, in addition to that, spaced, uh, based on my travels through South Asia, my negotiations, especially with Pakistan, and just the nature of the terrain, understanding how difficult it is, understanding that we're nowhere near even base camp when it comes to addressing the challenges that divide us, I felt taking a cue from the East Western Divan Orchestra that had been set up between Israel and Palestine about 20 years ago by Edward Said and Daniel Baron Boyd. I think it's based in Spain, I think. Uh, right, right now, now yes, yes, it is in Spain. It's about 20 years old. Yes. And it hasn't solved the problems between Israel and Palestine, but it's created a wonderful body of work. It's brought Israelis and Palestinians together. They've performed in difficult places like Ramallah. So I was very inspired inspired by that, and I love music, as you said. And I wanted to use diplomacy, or my experience in diplomacy, as an instrument to see how I could use the medium of an orchestra to try and bring South Asians together. It may sound romantic, it may sound idealistic, but let me tell you, peace is not a four-letter word. <laughs> so, you know, you said South Asian, but I find that in your journey, you've gone beyond South Asia. I mean, you've gone into Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Singapore, Southeast Asia, the Indian diaspora. So just tell us about this journey of the South Asian symphony. You started with the Sark countries, but actually you have extended your tentacles in a certain sense. Well, we don't have a tradition of orchestras in this region. Although in the Hindi film industry, I think in the 50s and 60s and even in the 70s, we did have orchestras. A lot of old music is orchestral music. But then I felt, why don't we use, and you know, today's diplomacy, you know, the Howdy Modi event in Houston, for instance, you had 50,000, you know, so many people from the diaspora, Indian Americans there. I said, why don't we use the talent and the know-how and the capacity within the diaspora to infuse their experience into building an orchestra for South Asia? And that's why I went beyond uh, the region. And it was always my intention. It was not that I started just with South Asia and then I'm groping around and I don't find enough people and I go to the diaspora. The first conductor of the orchestra is an Indian American from Houston, Vishwa Subaraman. Right. And he and I discussed this idea about six years ago. That was really the germ of the idea. So do we see one day a Howdy USA with you there uh, up front in front of the Americans? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of interest. We were featured, in fact, in the Symphony Magazine, which is the magazine of the League of American Orchestras, highly prestigious. They'd heard about our initiative and invited me, in fact, to con contribute a full page at the end of, you know, they have a, a section called CODA, right. where they invite people to speak about what they're doing. And I was given the opportunity. So it's obviously reaching far beyond a South Asian audience. Good. 
So it's kind of a Chola empire expanding, except this is the empire of music. There's no hegemony, <laughs> there's no expansionism involved. This is just at the humanitarian level, us trying to connect with each other. And when I think of the young musicians, some of the musicians in the orchestra are as young as 13. I know. And they come from, as you know, places like Afghanistan. And when they write about meeting after rehearsals, understanding what the other person is like, understanding that a stranger is just a friend you do not know, right. as the song goes. So I think that is what really encourages me and wanting, wants me, I want to sustain this. And let's also remember that in the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, goal, there are 17 goals, as you know. The goal number 16 of the SDGs is building institutions for peace. peace. So I consider myself as doing a little towards that. And most importantly, India is at the core of this initiative. India, citizens of India, have contributed, not only me and my husband, but friends like you too, Ravi. Right. We are all part of this right. initiative, Citizen Diplomacy for Peace. Great. Uh, you know, you mentioned Afghanistan, and you spoke about, I think, Ali was, is the youngest yeah, in Europe. Yeah, first of all, before we talk about Afghanistan, yeah. I'd like our friends here to just see yes, a short video that we made about peace notes. Can we have that up, please? The peace notes video, please. A pilgrimage transcending borders to share human stories and to forge friendships. A journey to merge distances, connect polyharmonic geographies, a vision to bridge, to transform, to inspire, to celebrate empathy, hope, equality, harmony. A triumph of the human spirit. Sound the clarion call to freedom. From Gandhi to Beethoven. A vision, a project, a journey of peace. Together, Let's spread the message of peace, harmony, and hope from India to South Asia and the world. Welcome to Peace Notes. So that incidentally was a video we did just before our concert in Bangalore earlier uh, in, a, in early October to celebrate Gandhiji's 150th birth anniversary. And the music, the soundtrack you heard, is completely original. It was commissioned by us. It's called Ham Safar. Right. And it took uh, seven songs from the eight countries of the region and we orchestrated it, and it's a beautiful composition. In fact, I think you have commissioned Hamsafa. There's also Badke, another composition that you have commissioned as an original Yes, composition. and Ideas of Freedom for the yeah. Gandhi concert. Right. Anand Nazareth, the young composer, right. did it for us, yes. So that's good. And the Indian connection comes through in the titling, you know, Hamsafa, Badke. There's a certain gentleman who wants to spread India, Hindi throughout India, I think you're going to take Hindi throughout the world. <laughs> well, I, I certainly hope so. And Bollywood music is so popular in any case. So. Uh, coming back to the Afghanistan, you know, we're talking about inspirational stories. You mentioned about the East-West Divan Orchestra between Israel and Palestine. I have been mesmerized by the story of Dr. Sarmast at the Afghan Institute of uh, Music, who is also a partner and collaborator with you. That's right. Could you give us a sense of what he does? And I believe they also have this uh, Zora which is an all-woman orchestra in Afghanistan. Quite I right. mean, that's quite amazing. So just talk us through this whole Afghan experience and their tryst with music. Yeah, in fact, members of, some members of Zora are also members of the South Asian Symphony Orchestra. And Dr. Sarmast has become a friend. He's, in, he's a force of nature. He set up the Afghan National Institute of Music, and he's done a lot to bring hope into the lives of young Afghans. As you know, they live in terribly trying circumstances. And I'd like you to now, I'd like to request that this clip of Arsen Fahim, yeah. a young Afghan member of our orchestra, be played because I cannot express it better than Arsen can. I think, yeah. Could we have the video, please? Arsen Fahim.
For a long time I had wanted to see a piano with my own eyes and actually hear it in person. But since I was a refugee living in Pakistan, that was not possible. In 2012, uh, an organization called SICO, the Afghan Child Care and Education Organization, uh, had uh, music lessons and I was fortunate enough to get a few lessons. And uh, I was in this learning center and I heard the sound of a piano coming from behind a door. And uh, even though I felt very nervous, I opened this door and entered this room and saw this beautiful grand piano for the first time and uh, the lid was open and uh, uh, someone was playing a Chopin etude and uh, I clearly did remember all of this because it was just that second that I decided that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life and I just fell in love with music at that second and I started the piano lessons on the same day and now I've been playing piano for almost seven years. Life can sometimes be tough, especially in a war zone, uh, for the hundreds of thousands of people who are very unlucky and sadly have to go through war. And as much as I would love to say that music can solve everything, it really can't. What it can do is bring us together, and that's a wonderful first step. And music can make hard times much easier. The South Asian Symphony Foundation brings together different countries from the region. Uh, I'm from Afghanistan, they're from India and from Nepal and uh, so on. And together, once we get the chance to meet each other, we get the chance to know each other and then we find the chance to love each other and come together and understand each other. And that's how I think this foundation can help the world and in a way change the world. My name is Arsen Fahim. I'm a pianist, a composer and a conductor. I think Arsen Fahim's story is an amazing one, I think. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and I think now, currently your youngest orchestra player is 11 years old, Ali? Uh, 13, 13, Ali Sina. He's 13 years old. And I think when he came to Bangalore last <laughs> two weeks ago, it was his first flight ever. Ever. His first flight abroad, he came to Bangalore. And yes, it was his first experience to be outside his country. So now, Ambassador, I mean, it's about a year and a half since you started. And I must admit, I was skeptical whether you can pull it off. But in one and a half years, you have done this symphony in Bombay. You did one in Bangalore. There's one coming up in the Partition Museum in Amritsar. You have held workshops where you get these musicians together. You have started building original compositions. So I think it's quite commendable what you have achieved in about one and a half years. And I mean, uh, more power to your elbow. But what are the key challenges that you see? Because as you mentioned, the East West Divan is 20 years old. There's an El Sistema in Venezuela, which is 40 years old as an institution. So what are the challenges as you go forward to build this institution? I think the main challenge, and I'll be very brutally honest and frank, is sustainability. So which means if you have brought checkbooks, it helps. <laughs> That's what sustainability means. And, uh, and to deal with the skepticism that you referred to. Because I would by no means call myself a Pollyanna or somebody who's just blindly optimistic. I've served in the trenches. I know how difficult things are. But I honestly feel that I've created something in which people seem so invested, the people in the orchestra. Right. They feel so invested. And they're doing it, most of them are professional musicians, they do it for free. We just pay for their travel and their stay. We give them a little honorarium. And they come all the way just for us and they want it to continue. Right. And that is really what makes my hope soar. And I think when I say sustainability, the East Western Divan Orchestra, or El Sistema, they've all survived on support either from governments or from wealthy patrons and well-wishers. And I think that's what the South Asian Symphony Orchestra also needs. Right now, it's just an India, created India-funded initiative. 
all the money that we've been able to bring into the foundation has essentially come from India right. because the rules don't permit us to get money from abroad. But there is, there are people, right-thinking people in India, and I have no doubt about that. My experience over the last one and a half years has shown. But we need an endowment. Without an endowment, I don't see how we can sustain this in a way that enables it to grow from strength to strength. But there's one determined person here, that's me. And I definitely intend to give it all I've got. And I also find you, I think you're a talent hunter. You have what, a database of 100 uh, South yes. Asian musicians? Yes, in fact, uh, all, from all around the world, I have a wonderful database of South Asian musicians today, something we never, never had. And I would like, you know, that kind of talent to grow from strength to strength, that list to go from strength to strength, because, because we are here on a journey, on a journey of peace. It's not just, you know, as they say in Hindi, you know, uh, not a band baja kind of uh, initiative. It's, it's different. It's very different from that. And somewhere I heard you also looking for people who can play wind and brass instruments. Apparently Indians don't do that too well. Well, we have a shortage of wind and brass, and, and I always joke, you know, just like we are, we are you know, hoping for a new avatar of a god to be born. The first Indian bassoonist is yet to be born. We don't have anybody who plays a bassoon. The bassoon, in case you don't know, it's a kind of a wind instrument, a long kind of, almost looks like a shehenai, a long shehenai. And we still don't have, we have to get people from abroad. Last time our conductor in Bangalore was a Singaporean of Sri Lankan origin. So we've gone into Southeast Asia, we've gone into the United States, we've gone to Europe, and uh, Thailand and Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. So we really have an international orchestra, but it's an Asian orchestra, a right. South Asian orchestra reaching out to the world. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to close with, you know, you're also a composer in your own right, you're a musician, and I think you have the, your own composition, Peace is My Dream. So if we could have you sing a part of this song, and uh, if you could take it away, Ambassador Rao. OK, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid I've got a bit of a sore throat, and voice may sound a little down. But we have a backing track, I think, which I'll request to be played. And I'll, I'll just sing a few words, because I think we're running out of time. Uh, we have another two, two and a half minutes. OK. Mm -hmm. Dictator Barka is backstage. She'll land up here. <laughs> <laughs> so two and a half minutes? Two and a half minutes, yeah. Because the song is a little longer than that. Three minutes. Three, three I'll sing a verse, perhaps? Yeah. yeah. I dreamt one day, one night of a play of eternal light, of eternal light in the mountain sky. It was a place where we held hands, a valley of grace where we were one where we were one and the tears of the dead were shed no more shed no more and the words we said as never before never before Woke the sleeping dawn. Peace, let's sweat for it. Let's not bleed in war, bleed in war, bleed in war. Peace, let's sweat for it. Let's not bleed. Thank you. I feel, I feel like a bit of a 
Killjoy here to stop it at one verse. It was absolutely beautiful, wasn't it? That was uh, my own composition. Uh, I wrote the words and music by two friends in Washington, Bob and Martha Hanrit. And thank you, and thank you, Barka, for the shout out for the Bangalore Lit Fest, November 9, 10, next weekend, same place but in the lounge. And I also said it's, <laughs> the, I also said <laughs> it's the best Lit Fest in the country. I heard that. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Nirupama, so, thank Nirupama, Ravi, hang on a second. We do want to honor everything Nirupama has done. I think she's broken multiple barriers, climbing to the top of her profession in the Foreign Service and now being such a believer. Uh, with the symphony orchestra. I want to call on stage another absolutely formidable lady, person, woman. She calls herself a chairman. I still want to call her chairperson. Maybe that can be part of the conversation. She's the chairman and senior managing director of Accenture. Rekha Menon, can we please have you on stage to honor Nirupama Rao? And can we please have the award on stage? Rekha, may I ask you to do the honors for Nirupama? And a big round of applause. This was wonderful.